Sige, we're now on the third step, the third letter R. So we read the passage like a pro. Read it purposefully, repeatedly, and then observantly. And then we realize our subjectivity. And now, retrace the historical background. Now, in this uh, stage, obviously, we will need some resources. Uh, there are portions in the Bible where we need to find out, for example, the geography. Sometimes we need to find out some uh, historical background or the cultural background regarding these passages. And that's why in the DVD that we have uh, offered for you, um, we have included there the e-sword. I just heard that there's now an e-sword for MacBook, but uh, it has a different uh, extension thing. But then, those who got the DVDs, make sure that you don't update that with the one with the uh, internet, because it will erase the old one, and then you will lose all the Bible uh, translations that you already have there. So just maintain the old one, and uh, because again, if you use the new e-sword from the internet, it will only supply you with about five translations, all right? And you, you miss all the other uh, resources that we have included there. As I said, 100 translations, 36 commentaries, 30 dictionaries, 12 Bible atlases, and then the 250 plus uh, books that we have included. That's why in that one DVD alone, that's about 3.8 gigabytes of information. And then as we've said, we have included the Tom Constable's uh, expository notes. I use this, uh, you know, in all my studies. It's in my laptop, uh, in my uh, iPad. So again, you have there the answer keys. You have uh, some of the PowerPoint presentations, but then basically the uh, PDF file of all the uh, frames that we have here. Okay, learn the Bible in 24 hours and then issues and answers. And then you also, of course, have there the uh, tutorial on how to install the uh, e-sword. Okay, so retrace the historical background. And uh, here, there are at least six gaps that we want to bridge. Six gaps. First of all is the chronological gap. Okay, chronological gap. Write that down. That's the first line that's blank there. The chronological gap. Now, we all realize that the Bible is not arranged chronologically, isn't it? This is how our Bibles are arranged, you know, the books in our Bible, the 66 books. And uh, this can be confusing because it's not arranged uh, historically or chronologically. So, for example, if you have the book of Job right there, and in terms of chronology, he's actually a contemporary of Abraham, and therefore the book of Job should be somewhere after Genesis or at least you know, after Genesis chapter 12 or, you know, about the same time there with uh, Abraham. And then you have there the book of Nehemiah, somewhere in the middle. And yet, the book of Nehemiah is what? Before the exile, during the exile, or after the exile? It was already after the exile. So this should be, you know, towards the end of our Bibles. Uh, that's where we have the book of Nehemiah. So sometimes that's the confusion Whenever you read the Bible, you need to know what part of history are you reading. All right? You need to be conscious of that so that uh, you'll be able to discern uh, who are the people being addressed here and what was their situation. And then, of course, these uh, four books here, they're all uh, poetic books, and most of them were written by David and Solomon. So it should be somewhere there, First, Second Chronicles, where we have those books. Now, in your manual... We've just included there an outline taken from uh, Harold the Wilmington's, uh, the Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, the 12 chronological stages. So just very quickly, very easily, dividing the Bible into 12 stages. If you're reading uh, the creation stage, you're just reading 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. The patriarchal stage is just Genesis 12 to 50 and the book of Job. And then the Exodus, Exodus stage, of course, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then you have Conquest, just one book. Judges, three books. And just, of course, part of Papa Samuel. And then you have the United Kingdom. So there's where you have the first king. Who's the first king? Saul. And then the finest king, the next king is? 
David, and then the fabulous king, of course, is Solomon. So you have there, uh, including their poetic uh, writings. And then the most confusing is the divided kingdom stage. So there you have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. There are some prophets assigned to the northern kingdom, other prophets assigned to the southern kingdom. So sometimes this is where the uh, confusion uh, occurs, the divided kingdom stage. So after Solomon uh, died, his son Rehoboam uh, took his place, but then he did not listen to uh, you know, the advisors of Solomon. Instead, listened to his barkada. And so uh, there was a split in the kingdom because of taxation. That's why in Cebu, we call him si Rehoboam, you know? <laughs> because of Rehoboam, na split ang kingdom. And uh, so, divided kingdom. And then, of course, you have the captivity stage. You only read two books during the captivity stage. The return stage, of course, those six books. All right. So those, and then the New Testament, that's a lot easier to divide. You have the four Gospels, and then, of course, the early church stage, and then the epistle uh, stage you have there. Chronological gap, you have resources there in your uh, DVD, uh, the different commentaries, and then the geographical gap. Twelve atlases in the DVD, geographical gap. Now, not all passages, obviously, will require a knowledge of geography, but you know what? There are some instances where knowledge of geography would actually enhance your understanding of what you're reading. You know, the first time I went to Israel last year, you know, somehow that has really affected the way I read the Bible because you actually see the places that they're talking about. Akala mo ang lalayo, pero ang lalapit lang pala. And so, because Israel is just a small country, you know, and... Um, but, you know, it, it really enhances how you read the Bible. For example, in the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a geographical detail here that is, you know, overlooked. And uh, here in the triumphal entry, of course, you, we need to understand what's happening here. This is the uh, temple area. The temple ground right here, the fortress Antonia is right there. That's the, that's the office of uh, Pontius Pilate. That's the Roman garrison. They have a tower right here. This is a tower overlooking what's happening here in the temple ground so that they can monitor if there's any riot. Uh, they're not allowed to go inside, obviously. But in the temple ground, there are two uh, businesses that are going on. One is the changing of the money. You know, they need to change the Roman currency into the temple currency because, you know, the Jews, they're so allergic to images. Uh, whose image is in the, in the Roman currency? Caesar. And so they're very allergic. They don't want any images. And so, when Jesus Christ said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Remember, he asked first, whose image do you see here? Caesar. So, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. Whose image are you? God's. So, that's it. So, this image belongs to Caesar, but you belong to God. And so, that's, the, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about. But then, there's a, uh, when you exchange your money, there's a almost 30%, uh, what do you call that? Markup. And so, meron kang 100 pesos, 70 pesos na lang babalik sa yung 30 pesos, mapupunta sa money changer. And the money changing business is owned by the high priest. So, it's the high priest who makes this a business, the cha changing money, uh, changing of currency there. And then, the second business, of course, is the buying of the animals for sacrifice. Now, the Levitical... Uh, Provision is very strict. It should be without blemish. Dapat walang sakit. You know, it's a year-old lamb. Pilipino kasi, mamamatay na, lutuin mo na yan, mamamatay na yan. You know, kahit patay na, ibinibenta pa rin sa market. Ano? And so, double dead. Pero the Levitical law is very strict. And so, it's actually cheaper to buy outside. You can buy sacrifices outside, but there'll be inspectors at the gate. And so, it's a quality control, babagsak ka you'll be forced to buy inside and the price inside is times five, the price outside. And that business is owned by the high priest. And so that's why the Lord Jesus Christ is so angry about this. You have turned my father's house into a den of robbers, a den of thieves. So galit na galit siya kapatid sa ginagawang negosyo ang relihiyon. And that's, that's the problem today. You know, ginagawang negosyo ang relihiyon. Pero yung DVD natin, Voluntarian. Voluntarian. 
support yan sa gawain natin. Hindi yan compulsory, kapatid. All right, just making that very clear, okay? So, so yun ang, uh, yun ang situation pag uh, we need to understand this. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 12, 11 and then going to John chapter 12, nandito siya sa Bethany. He was actually three kilometers going down because Jerusalem is on top of a hill. You go down and then nandito siya three kilometers sa Bethany. Something happened in John chapter 11 that caused people here to actually come down and see for themselves Lazarus because Lazarus was raised from the dead. And during this time, anong piesta? The feast of Passover. And so, you can imagine Jerusalem is just bulging with pilgrims from all over the world. They're all there. And so, you can just imagine yung excitement, yung, you know, that's, that's why we have the Uzi. You know, the Israelite Uzi? Yung mga Uzisero nagbabaan. Yun, mga Israelite Uzis. And so, they came down, and then the Lord Jesus Christ, instructed his uh, disciples to go to Bethpage. Before I call this Bethpage. But when I went to Israel, Bethpage pala ang tawag nila dyan. So they went to Bethpage and then uh, they un uh, untied the, uh, the colt, the, uh, the donkey, and then the Lord Jesus Christ, one and a half kilometers going up, uh, rode on this donkey. But then, right here, there's a fork in the road. By the way, the people, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, he comes in. Ano nga ibig sabihin ng Hosanna, Hosanna? Yeah, minsan kasi we think it's praise Him or praise the Lord or something, but literally it means save us or sometimes it's save us now. And so you can just imagine when people were welcoming Jesus and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, gave Him a, a red carpet treatment with their, with their cloaks on the road. They were actually asking Him to liberate them from what? Save them from what? The clutches of the Roman Empire. So that's the mindset. That's the context there. So as the Lord Jesus Christ enters, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. But then there's a fork in the road. As Jesus Christ was coming up, this fork in the road, if you turn right, you go straight to Fortress Antonia. But if you turn left, you go straight to the temple area. Now, with the people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, they were expecting Him to turn right or to turn left? They were expecting Him to turn right, go straight to Fortress Antonia, and then kick the Roman soldiers out of their garrison. Save us now. Instead, the Lord Jesus Christ turned left, went straight to the temple area, and then kicked the Jewish businessmen out of the temple area. Five days later, he's dead. You see, they didn't want a political, uh, a, a religious or a spiritual Messiah. The, what they wanted was a political Messiah. Somebody who will sit on the throne of David, which has been vacated for about 700 years. And so friends, that's the context right there. If you understand geography, you know, it enhances your understanding of the passage that you're reading. And uh, again, just that uh, information right there. So you have geographical gap, and then you have cultural gap. You have cultural gap, so write that down. Whenever you come across a culture, a cultural item in the Bible, you, are, you ask at least four questions, okay? You try to... Uh, engage with this in four ways. Number one, you uh, ask what is the form, what's the cultural form, and then what is the function of that cultural form, and then you ask is this something permanent, is the form permanent, or is the form only temporary, but the function remains, but the form can change. So that's how you engage with the culture. And so let's have some uh, samples here. First, Understand the cultural form. What is the function of that form? Is that form permanent? Or is that form temporary? Or the function has changed? So, those are the issues. For example, Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. What's the cultural form? Holy kiss. How do they do that? Paano yung holy kiss? Beso, beso. That's right. You actually see this. You know, if you go to the Middle East, they actually kiss the side here, no? Tapos, tatlo. One, two, and then three. And so they actually do that sometimes, you know, for us Filipinos, hi, kadiri, you know. <laughs> guy to guy, and uh, so that's, that's the way they do it. So, the form is holy kiss. The function is what? That's their greeting. So now the question, is this form permanent or is this only temporary? So it's only temporary. I have somebody, my young people said, I think, Pastor, we should 
continue this form. I think it's very good. And I said, I think your motive is wrong. <laughs> and so, again, it's only temporary. We just shake hands, of course. We high five. And then, kumerong uh, sipun, then just knuckles, all right? Just. Okay, next. Sample. Anoint the sick with oil. Permanent or temporary? So if you're an elder, you know there's some denominations, you always have to bring oil with you. You cannot go visitation without an oil. That means this becomes permanent. So is this permanent or temporary? Just a temporary arrangement. Again, what is interesting here is again, you go back to the original word because the word oil, there are actually two words. One is krio, and krio as a oil is ceremonial oil. That's what you use for anointing the priest, anointing the king, or anointing the prophet. That's krio. But the oil that was used here is not krio. It's not just ceremonious. It's aleipo, which is medicinal oil. So that means you actually bring oil and massage this person who is sick. All right? And so, again, if you want to bring oil in your visitation, no problem. But you don't make it permanent. You don't tell people, oh, wala kang oil, wag kang mag-visit. You know? So instead of bringing oil, you bring Starbucks coffee. Yun. <laughs> so medyo, that can really... Uh, help in the visitation. How about this one? Give up personal property. Acts chapter 2, 44 to 45. Huh? Permanent or temporary? Sa aming mga pastor, sana permanent. Sayang. Ganda sana. Of course, there's this guy in uh, Surigao. What's his name? Yes, Ecleo. You know, the uh, properties are given to the church. But of course, that was only a temporary arrangement that they have there. And uh, later on, when they had a uh, famine in the land, they had to seek help from the Gentile churches, you know, the Gentile Christian churches. And the Apostle Paul was able to gather some uh, uh, offering for the Jerusalem church. How about this one? Very controversial. Acts 15, 29. Abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Permanent or temporary? Permanent. Yun, yung iba, medyo narinig ko, permanent, iba, temporary. Okay. Yeah. Permanary. Okay. <laughs> Permanary. Again, we need to go back to the uh, original setting, Acts 15.29. This was the very first council, the Jerusalem council as we call them today. Why did the apostles, particularly James, call on all the apostles to discuss this? What was the issue about? The Gentiles coming to become Christians. And so, the mindset of the Jews at the time, for the Gentiles to become Christians, the Gentiles have to become Jews first, and then they can become Christians. And so they need, that means to be circumcised first, and then they need to eat kosher food, and then they can become Christians. And what was the argument of the Apostle Paul? Why he believes it doesn't have to go that way? They spoke in tongues. There was the evidence of the Holy Spirit, and it was clear. And so they say, no, the Gentiles, we cannot require them to have kosher food and be circumcised for salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Christ accepted them as they are. But what was the request? Because the early Christians were Jews, the elders were Jews, they get offended by this, in respect, abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols. As much as possible, because they stumble over these things. But later on, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter 8, the Apostle Paul made it very clear. You can eat anything that you want. But for the sake of love, in chapter 8, he said, you will avoid eating meat just to make sure that your brother will not stumble. But in terms of doctrine, you know, you can eat meat. So here's what he said, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and then 10. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions. Because the, the food, the meat that has been uh, sold in the meat market has already been parted three ways. When they offer this meat, one-third is burned, one-third is left with the priest, and then one-third you bring home. All right? So when you have guests, most likely the meat that will be served to you has already been served to an idol. 
But the apostles, these idols, they're not even true. You know, they're not real. Just pray and that God will bless this food. All right? But then he said, For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, so whatever you, you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Friends, food has nothing to do with salvation. Food has to do with stewardship of body. All right? In terms of stewardship, now that has, a, that has something. If you know you're diabetic, and then you keep on drinking Coke, wow, something is wrong. Because you're abusing your body. Remember, your body has already been bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus. Your body doesn't belong to you anymore. And so food has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with stewardship. So friends, here's my, here's my belief. All right? If you're a real Christian, if you're a born-again Christian, kahit kumain ka ng baboy, hindi ka pupunta sa impyerno. Mapapaaga ka sa langit. <laughs> That's what it is. No, you don't have to fear that you'll go to hell. You'll go to heaven early. All right? And so again, food has to do with stewardship. It has nothing to do with salvation. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear. He said, What defiles a man is not what comes in, but what comes out. That's what defiles us. All right? So again, food has nothing to do with salvation, but stewardship. How about this one? Be circumcised. Permanent or temporary? <laughs> Yung ibang bilis, temporary lang yan, temporary. <laughs> Alata mo agad eh. <laughs> Yes, of course. The Apostle Paul said, what is important is the circumcision of the heart. All right. How about this one? Wives should submit to their husbands. Permanent. 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 No need for exegesis. Permanent. <laughs> oh, bias now, bias. And then, of course, there's the language gap. There's the language gap. We've already been talking about, you know, the Hebrew language, the Greek language, and, you know, they have their nuances. I mean, it's a very good language in terms of being very specific about certain things. Um, and so it can be very rich. And it can be a problem for us if we don't know Greek. But praise God, we have so many resources today, especially the internet, where you can, even though you don't read Greek, you can find out what's the root word, what's the meaning of that word. And there's this particular translation of the Bible called the Discovery Bible. Okay, here's a, here's a page of the Discovery Bible. It's too bad that they no longer, they're no longer printing this. It's out of print. Uh, but you can still find in the internet, if you can find one, buy it. It's worth every centavo that you'll pay for it. But look at its distinct, the, uh, the distinctives that we have here. For example, all the verbs would have a symbol. Do you see the symbol there of the verb? There's a symbol like that. If you see that symbol, that means it's in the present tense. So as you're reading, you know immediately that it's in the present tense. So the way you need to read that is that you continuously bear much fruit. It's very clear as you read because you're guided by the uh, symbol. Another verb that we have there is a uh, kept. You see that word kept there and there's an arrow and that means it's in the perfect tense. Of course, the perfect tense is something that has already happened in the past but the effect is still continuing up to today. And so what he's saying here, I have kept, it means I have kept in the past and still do now. So that's what Christ is doing. I have kept... Uh, God's will in the past and uh, God's commandments in the past and I'm still doing it now. Not only the verbs here. Uh, by the way, here's a sample. Let's read this together. 11 to 13. Ready, read. Yes. 
for he cannot disown himself. Now tell me, which portion here bothers you? Which portion bothers you? Aha. Uh -huh. I mean, if we died, we also live. That's good. If we endure, we will. That's good. If we are faithless, we remain faithless. That's better. But then this one. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Wow. Now, what does that mean? Because every time we commit sin, every time we give in to temptation, it's like disowning him because we have a choice here, whether Satan or Christ. It's like disowning, turning our backs on him. And so here, if we disown him, again, the verb there, disown, is very interesting. This is uh, arnometha, it's in the present tense. And because it's in the present tense, that means what it's saying, if we continuously disown, it's not just a one-time disowning, meaning it's a, it's a habit, it's a lifestyle, it's a consciously, habitually disowning him. And friends, if, if that's, that's the way you live your life, even though you come to church every Sunday, he will disown you. You're not a Christian after all. I mean, it's possible to be a Christian in name or by name, and yet not a real, real Christian uh, by life. And then, of course, the word if is very interesting. The particle if there may state a condition in a hypothetical uh, basis. And so basically what it is saying, this means that any genuine believer will not persistently deny the Lord. And so again, if you understand the verb, then it, it begins to, uh, you know, help you understand what it is actually saying. So that's good. How about the word, some of the words here, there's a number reference right there. So the word love has 31A. Why 31A? Because there's B, there 31C. And there's actually four words for love, but they don't use the word eros in the New Testament. Storgos is always used only twice in the New Testament, but always with the letter A in front here. The prefix A, Asturgos, cancels out the word. That means there's no love. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, remember, in the last days, no love. And you know what is so interesting about Sturgos? This is instinctive kind of love. This is the intuitive kind of love. This should be the love of a mother for a baby. It's a love that you don't have to learn. In the last days, letter A, no love, no in intuitive kind of love. How many abortions are happening today? Mothers just, you know, they don't care about the baby. How many times we've heard of fathers raping their own daughters? No love right there. Twice in the New Testament, always in the negative. But friends, the agape and the phileo, that's where we have it. So here, 31A is definitely agape. God has agape us, or God has agape me. And then, the words, and my words, 43B. Why? Why 43B? Because there's 43A. And 43A is logos, 43B is rema. So what Jesus Christ is saying here is that the ordinary term for word is uh, rema, not the ordinary term for word which is logos, but rather the specific spoken word of Christ, which is rema. All right? So this Discovery Bible, you know, it's very interesting, very helpful, especially for us. You know, we do not read Greek, and the moment you open it, it's like watching television, black and white, and colored TV. That's the, that's the difference if you have this uh, Discovery Bible. And uh, before that, you know what? Every seminar, I would bring my Discovery Bible just to show people what it looks like. I have the uh, hardbound. The author came to the Philippines. He came to Cebu, and I have the author sign. So I have this with me. This is really one of my tools. In one of my seminars, I won't tell you which city, 50 pastors were there. They look at the Discovery Bible. It got lost. It got discovered. Wow, I really felt so bad. And you know what? Praise God, I was able to get another copy. And this time, I'm no longer bringing it. I, because I know there are pastors here also. All right! Okay! <laughs> just joking. But if you can get hold of the Discovery Bible, it's, right now it's just in the New Testament. 
They're working on the Old Testament. Uh, Archer, what's his name? Archer. Gleason Archer is the uh, advisor for this, uh, this translation. So I don't know, something happened to the author and uh, it's not yet out in the market. Anyway, so we have that and then we have that. And then here's the sample. Okay, let's read this together. Not that one. Right here. Okay, let's read this. Ready, read. Now, if you're going to research on this and find out what it means, choose a keyword. Can you choose a keyword there that would be so critical in understanding this verse? The word redemption would be a keyword, all right? And so I would uh, try to look for the meaning of this, especially going back to the Greek, because in the Greek, there are two words that can be translated redemption in English. One word in the Greek is agorazo, which means to buy a slave to set him free. So, ibig sabihin, they have a specific word for what purpose are you buying this slave. If you want to buy a slave to set him free, you go to the agora. Agora means the slave market. Agorazo, it's to set him free. So, sa mga kagayan di oro, they know this because agora is the market there. But if your purpose is to buy a slave, a runaway slave, in order to bring him back to the original owner. You use a different word, and that word is lutro, to buy a slave to return him. to the origin. He's a runaway slave, and you want to return him. Which word do you think was used for redemption here? Aguradso, all right. Actually, the word that was used is not aguradso, but lutro. You see, the reason why God redeemed us is to bring us back to the original owner. We are still slaves today. You are now a slave of Christ, but no longer the slave of Satan. But friends, we're still slaves today. We need to, we need to be clear about that. Some people, they think it's a garage, so Jesus Christ set us free, therefore, because we're saved, we can do anything we want because we're already saved anyway. And that's a, a wrong thinking. Just because you're saved, you're not being set free, you are still a slave today, but now a slave to Christ, instead of a slave to Satan. And I tell you, that's the best slavery if it's under Christ. Amen. That's the best slavery. If God, yes, praise God. If God would just set us free and just, you know, for us to do anything, we'll abuse His grace. So Lutro would be the word there. And then, very interesting, you'll notice that there are these red, do you, do you notice the red ink that they use? Red and then black. Do you, do you see the difference there? You know, there's a reason why they use the red and then the black. When this is red, it says there, Jesus emphasizes these words to powerfully bring out the great abundance of results which accompany a new life in Him. You see, what happens in the way they, you know, when they write Greek, because of the ending in Greek, the, every word has an ending, and the ending, you know the function of the word. That's why the word can be placed anywhere in the sentence because you know the function anyway. In the English, you cannot. You, you have to re arrange, rearrange it. So here's the thing. If they want to emphasize a word, they place that word at the start of the sentence to emphasize it. And here, you know that it is the emphasis because it's in the red color print. All right? So you know that's, that's the emphasis because it's in the red. So here, I have kept my father's commands. I, by emphasizing himself, Jesus is showing that obedience is necessary even for the Son of God to remain the Father's love. So let me give you an example. Let's say this statement, I think Paul can. I think Paul can. If there's no color, no color. It's just a simple statement, no emphasis, no color. Now, if the color is on the word I, I, maybe not you, but I think Paul can. The emphasis, the weight of meaning is on the eye because the color is on the eye. So you know the emphasis. So that means, maybe you don't think so, but I do. If the color is on the word think, I think, I'm not really sure, but I just think. So the emphasis on, I'm not sure, but I think Paul can. All right? So the color is on the think, that means maybe, he, I guess he can, but I'm not really that positive. If the color is on the word Paul, that means, I know Paul can, but Richard cannot. He's making a comparison. Paul can, but Richard cannot. Because the color is on the word Paul. The emphasis. I know Paul, but I, I'm not sure if Romeo can. Now, if the color is on the word can, that means, friends, I have no doubt about Paul's ability. 
Do you see the difference? Dahil sa kulay, you know where the weight of the meaning is. Nasaan yung emphasis? Yan ang kagandahan ng Greek kasi they know where the emphasis is. Pag translate sa English, they rearrange the words, we don't know already what's the emphasis. So sometimes you can, you know, come up with different meanings. Discovery Bible. If you can find one, buy it. But don't steal one, okay? Just just buy one. <laughs> All right. How about this one? Language gap, and then of course there's the literary gap. Literary gap. So again, here we can see that there are there are uh, nuances in the in Hebrew and in Greek. The way they write, it's different from the way we write today. You know, we have resources that's dealing just with this, uh, you know, nuances in the literary form. Like for example, a glaring example would be the way we write letters today. You know, if you write a letter today, ikaw ang nagsulat, you are the writer, where do you find your name as the writer? At the beginning of the letter or at the end of the letter? Yeah. At the end. But during the time of the Apostle Paul, where, you, where do you find the name of the writer? At the beginning. That's a literary gap. That's a difference. Why? It's because of the paper they use. It's uh, papyrus material. It's rolled up material. And so when they, re when they open up a scroll, you know, if the name of the writer is at the end, you know, they have to open. Sino ba nagsulat na ito? Pambihira namang taong to. Ah, saan ba to? Ay, kay Paul! Ay, nako, kay Paul pala galing to. Nako, si Rana. You know, it will disintegrate immediately. And so, when they open the scroll, immediately you see there who wrote it. And so again, that's, that's the literary gap. That's the difference in the way they write before, the way we write today. Also, uh, one difference is they don't have superlatives. You know, both Hebrew and Greek, they don't have superlatives. Today, we have hard, harder, hardest. All right? We have superlatives. But in their time, they don't have. They have to repeat a word to make it superlative. And so when you read the one in Isaiah, it says there, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's the superlative. This is the holiest, the Lord Almighty. They repeat the word. One pastor preached from this and he said, Do you know why there are three holies? Because one holy is for the Father, one holy is for the Son, and then the holy is the Holy Spirit. Wow! Okay! Praise God! That's the proof for the Trinity right there. Okay! Holy, holy, holy. And so again, the literary gap. I mean, we also do that even in our Tagalog, di ba? Pag sinabi mong, ang ganda niya pare, Maganda yun. Pero pag sinabi mo, ang ganda, ganda, ganda niya. Ay ba, superlative na yun. Tatlong beses mo ginamit yung ganda. So we also do that in our own language. Alright? And then, of course, the last is the uh, spiritual gap. Spiritual gap. There. Spiritual gap. So what we're saying here, friends, is as we study the Bible, I don't care how many PhDs you have, there will always be things that we will never be able to understand. We will never be able to fathom the infinite mind of God with our finite minds. It's like pouring the Pacific Ocean on a, on a cup, you know. There's just no way. So for a mouse to understand a cat, what has to happen to the mouse? The mouse has to become a cat to understand a cat. For a cat to understand a dog, what has to happen to the cat? It has to become a dog. For a dog to understand man, what has to happen to the dog? It has to become man. And for man to understand God, man has to become? And that will never happen. <laughs> Unless you're a Mormon. <laughs> because in Mormonism, when you die, you become God. But that's the very first lie of the enemy. You know, you'll become like God. And so there's the spiritual gap. Again, you may come up to me, ask questions at the end of the seminar, and I'm not, I'm not be able to answer it. I mean, I'm doing this seminar, but friends, I'm not saying that I know everything. There's still a lot of things that I don't understand when I, you know, when I uh, interact with these uh, pastors here in Tagaytay, they'll be able to add some more corrections, maybe improvements to all this presentation. 
I'm open to that because you know, there's so much, there's so many things. You know, when I finished my doctorate, you know how I felt? There's so much I don't understand. That's how I felt. There's so much I don't understand. You got a doctorate and yet you just have that feeling there's so much to learn. And yet, this is the only thing that I've learned here. And so friends, the spiritual gap. All right? Thank you.